There was once a man who was born in a land of mountains, where the people are self-sufficient and live close to the earth. All his life he dreamed and investigated his own dreams and other people's. Patients came to him to try to understand the wisdom of dreams. He was a successful psychiatrist who never ceased to speak of the soul, mythology and God. He was a scientist, a scholar and a traveller and always a dreamer. His dreams have changed our ideas. Before he died, he said, my work will be continued by those who suffer. His name was Carl Gustav Jung. The American psychoanalyst, Dr. Joseph Henderson, first met Jung in the 1930s. It was more, more wonderful than I had expected even. A wonderful man to work with, tremendous uh, 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 experience to work with, to, to meet Jung. Uh, it's almost impossible to describe what uh, that was like. A kind of union of a Swiss peasant and a, high, and a scholar and, a, and something more uh, of a more spiritual nature it describes a man that technically should not exist, but did. We all dream just as we all breathe. Throughout history, humankind has been intrigued by dreams and woken by nightmares. More than any man or woman before him, Carl Jung worked to understand where dreams came from and what meaning or purpose they had. Jung's task was immense, to define and understand the conscious and unconscious human personality. The whole personality of man is indescribable. His consciousness can be described. This unconscious cannot be described right. because the unconscious, as I must repeat myself, yeah. is always unconscious. Yeah. And is really unconscious <laughs> and really does not know it. Does, does not know about it. And so we don't know our, uh, our unconscious personality. We have hints, we have uh, certain ideas, uh, but uh, we don't know it really. Nobody can say where man ends. Yeah. That is the, uh, the beauty of it, you know. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting. Yeah. Uh, the unconscious of man can reach God knows where. There we are going to make discoveries. Jung made a host of discoveries. His work begins in dreams, but it lives in the real world. He was a scholar whose determination to understand his own dreams has given millions of people around the world a new insight into their own psychology, their dreams and their relationships. Jung himself used to retreat from his family and his patients to the tower which he built for himself on the shore of Lake Zurich at Bollingen. The tower became the focus of his introspection and his creativity. Here at Bollingen, Jung found a piece of land that was really alone and untouched and did not have that sense of being encroached upon by neighbors. Once you got there, it was like being in a different world. It's as though Jung had chosen this place to symbolize and represent his own belief in the integrity of the individual to find his own space. Jung was an original. He was also a loner, even in childhood. In his autobiography, written when he was in his 80s, he said, I played alone, daydreamed or strolled in the woods alone and had a secret world of my own. The pattern of my relationship to the world was already prefigured. Today as then, I am a solitary, because I know things and must hint at things which other people do not know, and usually do not want to know. Jung's work began with the experiences of his own inner life. His dreams led him to pursue medicine and psychiatry. His analytical psychology was never a scientific theory, but was the result of observing the inner life of his patients and the human quest for meaning through religion and mythology of all cultures. This house in Kusnacht near Zurich was where he studied, painted, received visitors and saw patients. One of those who arrived on his doorstep and became his patient and later an analyst himself was a 26-year-old American, Joe Wheelwright. We didn't choose our profession. 
Our profession chose us, but what we knew was that we were as neurotic as hell, and we better run, not walk, to the nearest analyst. In those days, nobody went into analysis with the thoughts of becoming an analyst themselves. I tried by trial and error all these different things, music and teaching and all that stuff and writing, and, uh, and all the bells were ringing and, uh, and the green lights were flashing, and I realized that this was my calling, this, this was it. This is what, I, what uh, I call God Albert, and this is what Albert had in mind for me, you know, uh, and uh, I'd better go along. And so I said, I, I, uh, I would like to, uh, to be an analyst. And Jung threw his hands up and he said, oh God, it happens over and over again. And the patients say, oh yes, I want to be, do what you do. I said, oh hell, I'm not that conceited. I don't suppose, I mean, I do in a sense, but of course I couldn't do it as well as you, uh, Herr Geheimrat, sir, you know, but I, uh, and he said, uh, uh, well, it's, it's too bad. And I said, no, but, but this is real. I, I, this is, I'm different. To which he replied, he loved American slang, and he replied, I'll bet. Dr. Dieter Baumann is one of Jung's grandsons and is a Jungian analyst himself, practicing in Zurich. He was not the kind of adult who would take an air of uh, authority or superiority, he had an absolutely natural authority, but uh, uh, he also initi initiated me uh, as a boy, you know, as a 10-year-old or 11-year-old boy uh, or so, he initiated me to drinking and to smoking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, he was that way. In a bad mood, he could be quite uh, unpredictable and rather frightening because he had a way of losing his temper about certain things that uh, you had no way of understanding. But as soon as he had let himself go and expressed his anger or distress or whatever it was, he then immediately got to work to find out what was behind it. And out would come something usually very helpful and curative both for him and for the situation. From his earliest childhood, he memorized and explored his own dreams and fantasies. He thought it was worth knowing what dreams were and what useful information they might contain. He was the first modern psychologist to believe that dreams were creative and relevant in understanding events in our real life. Before going to Basel University, Jung was torn between studying archaeology and anthropology or the sciences. He allowed his conviction in the wisdom of dreams to decide. In the first dream, I was in a dark wood that stretched along the Rhine. I came to a little hill, a burial mound, and began to dig. After a while, I turned up, to my astonishment, some bones of prehistoric animals. This interested me enormously, and at that moment I knew. I must get to know nature, the world in which we lived, and the things around us. Then came a second dream. Again, I was in a wood. It was threaded with watercourses and in the darkest place I saw a circular pool surrounded by dense undergrowth. Half immersed in the water lay the strangest and most wonderful creature, a round animal shimmering in opalescent hues and consisting of innumerable little cells or of organs shaped like tentacles. It aroused in me an intense desire for knowledge so that I awoke with a beating heart. These two dreams decided me overwhelmingly in favor of science and removed all my doubts. As an analyst, Jung's method was to treat dreams as facts which the doctor or scientist could observe. Dr. Gerhard Adler, who edited Jung's collected works and letters, had his own experience of Jung's practical attitude towards the psyche. My first interview with Jung was very significant. I had a dream the night before in which I traveled to India. It was, I saw this uh, great uh, triangle uh, of India, and I landed somewhere on the coast. I told this dream to Jung, and instead of analyzing, he took a large atlas out and sat down with me, kneeled, knelt down with me on the chair, and 
said, no, no, show me, where did you travel, where did you travel, show me. This was extremely, extremely important to me. Uh, it showed me uh, immediately that uh, the reality of society. Dr. Marie-Louise von Franz is an analyst whose work has covered almost as wide a span as Jung's own on alchemy, fairy tales, dream symbols, mythology and science. Now seriously ill, Dr. von Franz recalls her very first encounter with Jung and his insistence upon the reality of the psyche. He talked about a crazy girl and uh, said she was on the moon and talked about it at this, if it has been very real and being rational, I was indignant and said she hasn't been on the moon. And Jung says, yes, she has. And I thought, that cannot be. I said, that satellite of the Earth there, which is uninhabited, she hasn't been there. And he just looked at me and said, she has been on the moon. And I thought, that old man is crazy or, or I don't, or I am stupid. And then it suddenly dawned on me that he meant that what happened psychically is absolutely real to the one to whom it happens. So I suddenly realized the reality of the psyche. The girl was 18 years old and came from a cultivated family. At the age of 15, she had been seduced by her brother and abused by a schoolmate. From her 16th year on, she retreated into isolation. She told me that she had lived on the moon. As a result of the incest, she felt humiliated in the eyes of the world, but elevated in the realm of fantasy. The consequence was complete alienation from the world, a state of psychosis. She became extra mundane, as it were, and lost contact with humanity. By telling me her story, she had, in a sense, betrayed the demon and attached herself to an earthly human being. Hence, she was able to return to life and even to marry. Thereafter, I regarded the sufferings of the mentally ill in a different light, for I had gained insight into the richness and importance of their inner experience. To the psychotic patient, the moon visit was real. By taking it seriously and forming a human bond with the girl, Jung enabled her to return into the world of concrete reality from which she had fled. Ultimately, the psychosis subsided. Jung's approach to the reality of the psyche was innovative and unique. Jung was a typical Swiss citizen at heart, happiest among the lakes and mountains. On summer afternoons, he would sail on Lake Zurich as he considered his research into psychological illness and the vivid material in his patients' dreams. His deeply rooted feeling for the Swiss landscape balanced his efforts to gain a clearer insight into the workings of the unconscious mind. Until late in life, he would go driving up into the mountains. As a child, Jung went with his father to Mount Ricky near Lucerne. Having only enough money for one ticket, Paul Jung sent his son on the mountain railway alone. Standing on the mountaintop, Jung later wrote that he felt himself to be in God's world. The reality of the psyche underpinned all Jung's work, and such was its impact that it brought new words into our everyday language. It was Jung who first used the terms extrovert and introvert, and the word persona for the mask which hides our true self. He coined the word synchronicity for his theory of meaningful coincidence. With Freud, he alerted us to our complexes and made us aware of an unconscious dimension beneath concrete experience. He defined the unconscious thus. Everything of which I know, but of which I'm not at the moment thinking. Everything of which I was once conscious, but have now forgotten. 
Everything perceived by my senses, but not noted by my conscious mind. Everything which, involuntarily and without paying attention to it, I feel, think, remember, want and do. All future things that are taking shape in me and will sometime come to consciousness. All this is the content of the unconscious. The research comes to the question of the unconscious. There, things become necessarily blurred because the unconscious is something which is really unconscious. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you have no object, you yeah, see nothing. Yeah. No, no. You only can make inferences, you know. And uh, so we have to, uh, to create uh, a model of this possible structure of yeah. the unconscious because we can't see it. To this end, Jung developed the word association test, the most familiar of all psychological testing devices, which provided a means of locating what he chose to call a complex. Kopf. House. The test requires the patient to say a word in immediate Oui. response to the doctor's stimulus word. The speed of response and the patient's pulse and respiration were measured at the same time. Jung's innovation was to consider why some test words cause patients to hesitate or to become anxious. And then I began to study these places in the experiment where the attention or the capability apparently of the test person began to wave or to disappear. And I found soon out that uh, it is a matter of intimate personal affairs people were thinking of or which were in them, even if they momentarily did not think of them, when they were unconscious with other words, that nevertheless an inhibition came from the unconscious and hindered the expression in speech. That's exactly the beginning of the whole uh, development of Jungian psychology when he did this uh, word association test and discovered that there uh, were strange interferences from some somewhere else or somebody else in the way in which we try to react, to answer. And therefore he began to call this a complex fenster. Often. Much of what we had hitherto regarded as senseless was not as crazy as it seemed. More than once I have seen that even with such patients, there remains in the background a personality which must be called normal. It stands looking on, so to speak. Reich. Arm. Dr. Jeffrey Satinova is a psychiatrist and Jungian analyst in Stamford, Connecticut in the United States. With computer technology, he can measure the functioning of the brain far more precisely than Jung was able to do 80 years ago. His use of visual or verbal stimulus and an electronic picture of the brain's response, timed in microseconds, represent a high-technology descendant of Jung's word association test. Basically, what Jung did with the word association experiment was use a stimulus and then measure physiological responses as they correlated to psychological responses. So at the same time that he was taking careful note of the patient's associations, the thinking that was taking place cognitively, he was also observing uh, pulse, respiratory rate, uh, the volume of blood in the finger, and skin conductivity, all of which are essentially measures of anxiety. He didn't conceptualize it that way at the time, but basically what he was doing was, was identifying the physiological components of an anxious reaction. Yes, that's right. The polygraph or lie detector test is also derived from Jung's pioneering work. The word association test conclusively identified the existence of an unconscious voice, separate from a person's conscious mental processes. What it reveals is that the physiology of the individual is a separate entity from, from the ego. So it's as though uh, a, a second personality is standing behind me when I'm taking the lie detector test and you ask me a question that I don't want to uh, acknowledge, and I'll say no, and uh, the, the man standing behind me will say, oh, yes. That's, that's what 
the physiological response does. So it, it, it tells us, uh, uh, just in irrefutable terms, that there is a second entity, a second psychic center uh, in, the, in the human psyche, uh, and uh, it's interested in truth. Psychological truth is revealed in dreams, too, and in rituals like the annual Fasnacht. All over Switzerland, especially in Basel, Swiss order gives way to the disorder of the piccolos, the fifes and drums, the confusion and colour of a vivid Lenten carnival, a carnival of truth. Analyst Gerhard Adler. It tells us the truth, that the real depths of the human psychology uh, this is usually hidden. If you take the proverbially uh, reticent Swiss, suddenly it breaks out. Suddenly it is uh, something there that uh, one wouldn't expect. But it is, of course, the truth. The Swiss are really very wild people. <laughs> For the proverbially reticent Swiss, Fasnacht is a license for misbehavior. Jung first encountered Fasnacht as a medical student in Basel, and later took some of his friends and pupils to witness firsthand this eruption of the national unconscious, revealing perhaps the true identity of the Swiss. Well, true identity in an unconscious sense, they had a side to themselves or a layer to themselves, which usually didn't come out. And it also wasn't this orgastic experience of the wild Festnacht, where they uh, could let themselves go. For Dieter Baumann, as for his grandfather Jung, the Festnacht scene was an appealing free expression of the Swiss unconscious. At a given point, uh, I think it has also to do with my age, uh, I, I bought myself a, a piccolo and I started to practice and then uh, uh, I went, I started to go. Uh, I liked the music and uh, the whole uh, love and, and skill and uh, pain people take to create Fasnacht. In Basel, Dozens of studios are devoted to the painstaking craft of styling and painting new masks each year. Jung made the psychological observation that in daily life, in every culture, people wear a kind of mask, which he called our persona. The original meaning of the Latin word persona was an actor's mask. So, the persona is partially uh, the result of the demands society has. And on the other side, it is a, a, a compromise with what one likes to be, or with what, or as one likes to appear. Uh -huh. Say, yeah. Now, this is not the real personality, in spite of the fact that people will assure you that it is that is all quite real and uh, quite honest. Yet it is not. Now, uh, such a uh, performance, or uh, say. Yeah, the, the performance of the, uh, of the persona uh, is quite all right, as long as you know that you are not identical with the way in which you appear. A ritual like Fasnacht allows the unconscious truth of the individual personality to emerge. At Fasnacht, everyone is masked. In their masks, they may insult their friends or colleagues by telling them the kinds of truths which for the rest of the year they might suppress. It is the opposite of the mask which we normally wear in order to take our place in the world. We were masked all the time and we had to get behind the mask. We had to realize that we had the mask. Persona was also, on the other hand, something necessary because we can't uh, jump as our true being at everybody. We have to be uh, careful. When Jung's party visited Basel, they got up at three in the morning to witness the Morgenstreich. As four o'clock approaches, 
in the February cold, all the streetlights are turned out, and as the cathedral bells strike the hour, lanterns are lit, the bands begin to march and to play their fife and drums. With each band clashing against the others, the traditional pagan music drowns out the cold, and the lanterns swirl their satire in the darkness. This is the Morgenstrike, which ushers in three days of Fasnacht revelry. I happened to be in the army then, uh, and I was in the barrack. It, uh, it was a former monastery uh, on the other side of the Rhine, and I was awaked by the so-called Morgenstreich, which is the beat of the morning, meaning the drum beat. And I went to the window, and in the distance I saw the middle Rhine bridge and on the bridge these circulating lights which went from one side uh, to the other and, and vice versa. Very, uh, do you say eerie or is that the word? Uh, like elves coming out of the ground of the town and uh, it was uh, drums and fives and these lights, these uh, spirits. In the early hours, the streets are filled with the noise and images of a crowded dream. As day breaks, the masks and costumes can be seen more clearly. The carnival weaves its way through the streets like an impromptu congress of fairy tale characters. As the light comes up, so the dream fades. Masks are discarded or replaced by the more familiar mask of persona, allowing Basel's everyday business to resume for the morning as if nothing has happened. The Fasnacht main parade invades the streets later in the day. There are marching bands playing what is called googie music, a raucous brass cacophony played deliberately out of tune. The participants belong to cliques, which every year decide upon a theme for their masks, their lanterns and the huge heads which lead the bands through the streets. may be formed from a group of friends, from professional groups like waiters or industrial scientists, and there are a number of all-women cliques. Local politics, ecology, television personalities or elaborate cultural jokes are all pitched into the carnival of propaganda. What is particularly interesting, I think, about the Basel of Asnacht, is that there are so many so-called Wackis. The figure of the Wackis is the Alsatian peasant. And they have a, a very earthy character, I, I should say, and a very funny and, uh, of course, very grotesque. And I have the impression nature here reminds psychically that actually we are peasants and should take care, care of the earth. To Jung's grandson, Dieter Baumann, the Wackis reflect a lost sense of connection to the environment. To Jung, such ritualized performance expressed the true primitive unconscious beneath the technocratic persona of Switzerland and of Basel. It is the spirit of the dead who, who become alive again. It's the ancestral spirit. One cannot really explain it. Uh, but an aspect is certainly that the unconscious comes out. And on one hand, it is a reconnection with the heathen uh, past and uh, with the natural uh, past and I think the Fasnacht is a unconscious 
religion. Fastnacht gives expression to the unconscious truth of the Swiss psyche. Unconscious religion is a theme which became prominent in Jung's ideas in later life. By the time Jung had completed his studies in Basel, he had himself experienced the reality of the unconscious psyche and the independent energy of dreams. Jung began his professional career in 1900. He met and married Emma Rauschenbach, and in 1908, the Jungs built the lakeside house at Kusnacht, where they spent almost 50 years together. Professionally, Jung was following the lead of Sigmund Freud, the Viennese originator of psychoanalysis and the study of the unconscious. Jung and Freud first met in 1909. They felt an immediate affinity for each other. Jung was the pupil and Freud the master. Freud today is considered the more significant theorist and thinker, but Jung's influence as a practical psychiatrist is equally important. Analyst Andrew Samuels. You know it's possible to watch films on Jung, to read books on Jung, and not know that the guy was a psychiatrist? That until he became old and rather bored with it, he saw patients? That he wrote paper after paper about how to do therapy? that there are 1,200 Jungian analysts in the world and thousands more therapists who are influenced by Jungian ideas and by analytical psychology. He was interested in psychopathology. He had something to say about depression. He had something to say about schizophrenia. He had something to say about hysteria. Jung regarded schizophrenic fantasies as having no less value than dreams and just as much reality of meaning for the individual patient. His approach was completely new. He invited his patients to paint their dream images or their fantasies and bring them to concrete reality. His conviction in the reality of the psyche has influenced many modern approaches to mental illness. He must have been the first person in Europe to use dancing and art and things like that as therapy for patients. He took the view that we needed to express ourselves and the works of art or the little talismans, he called them, that we produce are means to our own spiritual growth. Jung saw the unconscious as creative and independent. Freud thought it just contained what the conscious mind repressed. The more Jung investigated the unconscious, the less he could agree with Freudian theory. After my uh, association experiments, when I realized uh, that there is obviously an unconscious. Uh, the question was, now, what is this unconscious? Does it consist merely of rests, of remnants, of uh, conscious activities? Or are there uh, things that are practically forever unconscious? In other words, is the unconscious a factor in itself? And I soon came to the conclusion that the unconscious must be a factor in itself uh, because I observe time and again that, for instance, uh, uh, beings or um, uh, schizophrenic patients, uh, delusions, fantasies, uh, contain the motives which they couldn't possibly have acquired uh, in our surroundings. Jung and Freud were very different men with different approaches. Their split followed Jung's most original and controversial discovery, that of the collective unconscious, an idea which, characteristically, he deduced from a dream. I was in a house I did not know. It was my house. In the upper story, there was a kind of salon furnished in Rococo style. I did not know what the lower floor looked like. 
There, everything was much older. This part of the house must date from the 15th or 16th century. The furnishings were medieval. The floors were of red brick. I went from one room to another, thinking, now I really must explore the whole house. I came upon a heavy door and opened it. A stone stairway led down into the cellar. Descending again, I found myself in a beautifully vaulted room which looked exceedingly ancient. The walls dated from Roman times. The floor was of stone slabs, and in one of these I discovered a ring. The stone slab lifted, and I saw a staircase of narrow stone steps leading down. I descended and entered a low cave. In the dust were scattered bones and broken pottery, like remains of a primitive culture. I discovered two human skulls, obviously very old and half disintegrated. Then I awoke. It was plain to me that the house represented a kind of image of the psyche. Consciousness was represented by the salon. It had an inhabited atmosphere. The ground floor stood for the first level of the unconscious. The deeper I went, the more alien and the darker the scene became. The Roman cellar and the prehistoric cave, these signified past times and past stages of consciousness. My dream obviously pointed to the foundations of cultural history, a history of successive layers of consciousness. My dream thus constituted a kind of structural diagram of the human psyche. It was my first inkling of a collective beneath the personal psyche. To Jung's followers, his discovery of a collective unconscious is critical. It represents a deep and timeless fund of human instincts and images in the psyche, which Jung called archetypes. This linking up of the cutting edge of psychological investigation with archaic thinking with a kind of mental archaeology. This is fascinating to me and it's really important for several reasons. Firstly, because it does away with the hubris or inflation of there being lots and lots of breakthroughs. And secondly, because the continuity of human ideation, thought, culture seems to me very important, particularly in our age, which in every sense is atomizing we need to know that we're not actually different from what we were hundreds of thousands of years ago. The instincts and archetypes together form the collective unconscious. I call it collective because unlike the personal unconscious, it is not made up of individual and more or less unique contents, but of those which are universal and of regular occurrence. After the split with Freud, Jung experienced a profound psychological turmoil, which he called his confrontation with the unconscious. Dr. Adolf Guggenbull Craig. You know, when he died, I think there was a leading article in one of the American journals who said he was actually psychotic, or they said he was a man who was schizophrenic and cured himself. Jung resigned his hospital job he was confronted by overpowering dreams and visions, and he struggled to express the images of his own unconscious in painting, sculpture, and word. Jung, who was never himself analyzed, now began four years of intense self-analysis. You can only deal with the unconscious by images, and he had a great gift to deal with images, but there is no special method. I mean, you could ask, was there any special method by which Dante was able to walk through hell and, and purgatory and heaven? There was no method, he just was able to do it. By 1920, the crisis had passed. Jung emerged to undertake 40 years of study, writing and working with patients. He began to consider how the rift which arose between himself and Freud was attributable to their different character or type, and how people's psychological outlook in general could be defined. In 1921, 
Jung published Psychological Types. I'd never known anything that was as illuminating as that book was. Suddenly we'd got tools to work with. Instead of trying to exterminate each other, why uh, we could understand much better why we were the way we were and, and why we came on as we did come on and so forth and so forth. And uh, it was uh, enormously helpful. Oh, it was a revelation. It was absolutely uh, uh, revolutionary in our lives. Joe and Jane Wheelwright were both patients of Jung and both became analysts. More than 50 years ago, Jung's English assistant gave Joe Wheelwright a copy of Psychological Types, the work which gave us the terms introvert and extrovert and the four psychological functions. Jung defined four main types from his observations of patients, friends and colleagues. Thinking, feeling, sensation and intuition. Well, there is a, quite a simple explanation uh, of these uh, terms and it, it shows at the same time how I arrived at uh, such a uh, uh, typology. Uh, namely, sensation tells you that there is something. Thinking, roughly speaking, tells you uh, what it is. Feeling tells you whether it is agreeable or not mm -hmm. to be accepted or not accepted or rejected. Yes. And intuition out there is a, a difficulty. You find them intuitive types, for instance, amongst bankers, mm -hmm. uh, or, or Wall Street men. Yeah. They follow hunches, you know, gamblers of all descriptions. Yeah. Uh, you, you find the type very frequently among doctors because it helps them in their prognosis. It's just a, a sort of uh, a skeleton yeah. uh, to which you have to add the, the flesh. And, and, and so it is uh, a, a means to an end. It only makes sense, uh, uh, such a scheme, uh, when, when, you have, when you deal with practical cases. The wheelwrights themselves are a vivid illustration of Jung's theory of types and of his view that opposite types attract and then get into conflict. Everybody knows that women feel and men think. I mean, that's on page three of any book that you pick up. Uh, well, in our family, it happens to be t'other way of which. I can't think my way out of a paper bag, and my wife has an absolutely first-class mind. Women are supposed to feel, and men are supposed to think. Joe did the feeling, and I did the thinking, and so we were upside down. Tell me what Jung's theory of typology has meant to you in a personal way. Well, I'm an introvert, and uh, I'm a sensation type. What and does that mean exactly? Sensation means facts. It's got to be a fact. You can't fool around with it. You've got to nail it down. It's got to be black and white. And, uh, and then secondarily, thinking. And for a woman, that wasn't allowed in those days. Her dominant functions were sensation and thinking. That's Yours were what? I'm intuition and feeling. We're polar opposites. In that order? We're polar opposites. In, yes, and I, she's very introverted, and I'm slightly extroverted. Uh, um, only slightly. Only slightly, of course, fanatically. For instance, it is uh, very often the case, one could almost say, it is almost a rule, but I don't want to make too many rules, <laughs> in order not to be schematic, yeah. uh, that an introvert marries an extrovert for compensation, or another type, marries the counter type, to complement himself. Did that also mean that you were in conflict? A lots of conflict. I didn't know what was going on half the time with him. And he was baffled by me. We were saying very nasty things to each other and doing an awful lot of misunderstanding, and, and my relationship to Jane was then, as it has been always, the central fact of my life, I think. And uh, so I, I, uh, um, I wanted to do something about it. Uh, uh, our marriage would have, I think, would have uh, probably had to break up if we'd gone on uh, in blissful ignorance. And uh, so that was... Uh, so that's what really brought me into Jungian psychology, was, was, was the type stuff. And I've been hipped on it ever since. And, uh, and I, I sort of, everybody 
dodges when they see me coming because they know I'm going to make a speech pretty soon about types. Jung was 46 when he published Psychological Types. His practice in Kusnacht was prospering, his reputation growing, and he travelled widely. But his roots were in Switzerland. In 1923, Jung bought a piece of land at Bolingen. This amateur film shows him supervising the building work for his tower, which was to become his refuge and retreat. Jung's classical scholarship and his skills as a craftsman left their mark on the tower, giving shape and expression to images and symbols from his own dreams and his fertile unconscious. In later life, Jung immersed himself more and more in his own inner life at Bolingen, where he found a deep spiritual peace. I am in the midst of my true life. I am most deeply myself. At times I feel as if I am spread out over the landscape and inside things, and I am myself living in every tree, in the plashing of the waves, in the clouds and animals that come and go, in the procession of the seasons. Without my piece of earth, my life's work would not have come into being. Jung's father was a Protestant minister, and Jung himself found religion to be an inescapable reality of the human psyche. A few miles from Bolingham stands the Benedictine monastery of Einsiedel, with its mysterious black Madonna. Jung was a practical scientist who regarded the soul and the spiritual as realities of inner experience. In the 19th century, one even tried to have a psychology without soul. And he was courageous enough to face soul, because human soul is something very frightening. And what made him was that he was maybe frightened too, but able all the same to face it, to face psyche. We all have a religious side, and it was one of Jung's courageous statements saying that we cannot deal with human psyche without having to deal with religion. For him, religious realities are realities because they have effects. They, they bring about events in our psychic life and so on. Jung was a non-realist about religion. That is, he didn't think of religious objects as beings out there. He thought their true and most vivid meaning was within the psyche. So, for example, the real encounter with God was the encounter with your own unconscious. Just a few months before he died, Jung summarised the religious emphasis of his life's work in a letter to an English correspondent. It's an amazing letter. One of the passages that struck me most strongly was one where he says, I have failed in my foremost task to open people's eyes to the fact that man has a soul, that there is a buried treasure in the field, and that our religion and philosophy are in a lamentable state. It's the human soul. That, that's the buried treasure. Jung's work covered more than just clinical observation. He considered the psychological meaning of mythology and fairy tales, of alchemy, astrology, and flying saucers. He received honorary doctorates all around the world on his 80th birthday in 1955. Despite his vast range of work and thought and the international reputation he had gained, Jung retained his humour and humility. I made some comment about his encyclopedic knowledge. The reason it was so meaningful to me was that it didn't come out like knowledge that it wasn't, uh, he wasn't casting pearls before swine, and he, and he wasn't uh, uh, preaching a gospel, and he wasn't uh, doing any of those things. And he said, the older I get, and he was a child of, then of about 75, I guess, and he said, the older I get, the more I realize that I don't know enough 
to entirely cover my little fingernail to be room for a bit more. Jung spent his life in the pioneering work of bringing together the conscious outer part of the psyche with the rich, deeper energies of the unconscious. When Carl Gustav Jung died and was buried in the family grave in the churchyard at Kusnacht, the village pastor declared he had given man the courage to have a soul again. There once was a man who lived among mountains. All his life he dreamed and investigated dreams and legends. He studied other countries, other cultures and other ages. He was a traveler, a scientist and a scholar. His dreams have changed our ideas. His name was Carl Gustav Jung. My dear friend, Dr. Young, I receive your always welcome letter. Indeed, I am very glad to hear from you. What I told you the day we was top the roof, you understand me correct. And also, I will tell you more that you can write in that book. For the traditional Indians, the mythology is part and parcel of their whole social system. <clears throat> they don't just believe in myths, the myth is their culture. Their way of life is their myth. The Swiss psychologist Carl Gustav Jung spent the early part of his working life investigating the personal unconscious through dreams. But he devoted the second half of his career to researching what he called the collective unconscious, which connected people of different cultures at the deeper level of dreams, ritual, religion and mythology. The author, Count Nikolai Tolstoy. It would be very hard to explain, it seems to me, for the universality of certain myths, which repeat themselves and sometimes in, in um, or very often, in uh, strikingly similar detail in very different um, cultures and societies. And I don't see how that could be explained unless there's something springing up, so to speak, from uh, universally within men, which Jung gave this um, term, the collective unconscious. The concept of the collective unconscious is absolutely essential for understanding Jung. I can't say it was his invention, but it was his discovery. The collective unconscious is that set of building blocks from which human reality is made. And it's as if there is this great reservoir outside of time and space, patterns, energy. Mankind struggles to give it definition like this, from which everything is drawn or everything is made. Jung observed a lack of meaning in the lives of his patients and in modern European culture in general. He studied mythology, 
legends, fairy tales and religions in many languages to see what they shared and what European culture lacked. In 1925, Jung set off to visit the Algonyi tribe in Kenya. His companion was the English psychiatrist Godwin Baines, who had worked in Zurich as Jung's assistant. Together, he and Baines filmed their expedition in search of psychological discoveries. They trekked for weeks through the highlands of Kenya towards Mount Elgon. Their African destination was an extreme contrast from the Europe of the 1920s. Jung was fascinated by primitive societies in which mythology and ritual defined the role and meaning of the individual person's life. Jung was 50 and white-haired. The African tribesmen honoured him with the title Mzi, or old man. They were as fascinated by the white European doctor as he was by them. He had learnt some Swahili, and as always, he asked everyone he met about their dreams and the importance they gave to dreaming. Dr Joe Wheelwright. His visit to Africa certainly helped to inform him on the subject of dreams and to differentiate between what he called big dreams and little dreams. And this had to do with whether the dream was from the collective unconscious, from the deepest layers, or whether it was from the personal unconscious. Because a big dream came from the collective unconscious and was really universal in its import. Jung's expedition party spent six weeks living among the Elgonyi. In conversation with the elders of the tribe, Jung asked them about their religious practices and their dreams. In particular, the Swiss doctor of medicine conferred with the Labon, or medicine man. He answered with tears in his eyes. In old days, the Labons had dreams and knew whether there is war or sickness, or whether rain comes or whether herds should be driven. But since the whites were in Africa, he said, no one had dreams anymore. The divine voice which counseled the tribe was no longer needed because the English know better. Our camp life proved to be one of the loveliest interludes in my life. I enjoyed the divine peace of a still primeval country. Never had I seen so clearly man and other animals. Thousands of miles lay between me and Europe, mother of all demons. In traveling to Africa to find a psychic observation post outside the sphere of the European, I unconsciously wanted to find that part of my personality which had become invisible under the influence and pressure of being European. Jung's journey to Africa was his longest and most dramatic adventure into unknown psychic territory. The distance and the difference of cultural patterns gave him a sense of perspective on the civilized Western psyche. Jung had first visited the United States with Sigmund Freud in 1909. Three years later, his reputation in America growing rapidly, Jung was invited to visit St. Elizabeth's in Washington, D.C., then, as now, the principal psychiatric hospital in the United States. He wanted to discover where the black patients there had the same sorts of dreams as white Europeans, a question no one had ever asked before. Unlike the men and women at St. Elizabeth's today, the patients of 75 years ago had never been asked about their dreams. When Jung talked to them, he found that the dreams, fantasies and artwork of Negro patients reminded him of his European patients' dreams, and that both contained ideas and images found in ancient mythology. In all probability, the most important mythological motifs are common to all times and races. I have, in fact, been able to demonstrate a whole series of motifs from Greek mythology in the dreams and fantasies of purebred Negroes suffering from mental disorders. Back in Switzerland, Jung put his observations to use in the work to which he always returned, that of healing the psyche. 
through my acquaintance with many Americans and my trips to and in America, I have obtained an enormous amount of insight into the European character. On my next trip to the United States, I went with a group of American friends to visit the Indians of New Mexico, the city building Pueblos. Jung visited Taos Pueblo, the oldest settlement of the Pueblo Indians. The Pueblo tribe, like the Hopi, the Navajo and the Acoma, are one of the many tribes of the Anasazi culture, whose original homes are now ruins, like the White House in the Canyon de Chey in eastern Arizona. These oldest inhabitants of North America are farming peoples whose history, mythology, religion and calendar are all interwoven. Their tradition is one of living close to the earth and the elements, attuned to the seasons, related to their gods. For them, the earth is mother and the sun father. In 1923, Jung visited New Mexico and went with friends to Taos, anxious to know more. Dr. Joe Henderson. He was very impressed by a medicine man he met there called Mountain Lake, and he always liked to repeat what Mountain Lake had said, that the, the Americans were all crazy because they think with their heads instead of with their hearts, the way the Indians do. Mountain Lake shared with him the, the, the Indian religious view that uh, their, their rituals uh, help the sun to come up every day and that without, without their help, uh, the sun would, start, would stop coming, coming up. And uh, that piece of information and the meeting of a living embodiment, a representative of such a way of life, struck a very deep chord in Jung. Mountain Lake was the English name of Oquia Biano, a Pueblo elder who talked to Jung about the tribal life of the Taos Indians in the 1920s and about their traditional religion. His granddaughter, Martha Suazo, still lives in Taos and has preserved the letters which Mountain Lake wrote to Jung later. My grandfather was uh, uh, Blue Lake Mountain and uh, also known as uh, Antonio Marival of the Taos Pueblo tribe. He was a member of the Taos Pueblo Council and uh, he lived here until he died. My dear friend, Dr. Young, many moons gone by since I hear from you. I've been thinking of you many times to write to you, but I lost your You know, address. you corresponded with a lot of people and and as a child, uh, I was always over at his house, and I would see some of the letters that some of the people would, would write to him. My dear friend, Mountain Lake, it was very nice of you indeed that you wrote a letter to me. I thought you had quite forgotten me. I often thought of you in the meantime, and I even talked of you often to my pupils. Are your young men still Sometimes he would be sitting son? there. He had a big Are table. Um, it was a dining table, but he used it for a desk, you know, and he had all his, his uh, boxes of paper and, and whatever, you know. And he would be sitting there sometimes writing letters to people. Ten years after our religion is destroyed, the whole world will see that we have been working for the whole world. As I told you, our great father, the son, is the one who supports the whole world. And that's our duties to help our great father, the sun. I really don't know maybe to what depth he told Young, but uh, he, he made an impression on him and Dr. Young made an impression on my grandfather. My old Pueblo friend thought that the raison d'etre of his Pueblo had been to help the sun to cross the sky. I envied him for the fullness of meaning in that belief. That was my grandfather's philosophy, that if our Taos Pueblo Indians stopped practicing their religion, 
he said give or uh, take 10 years that the whole world would end after all that's what's keeping this world going In 1963, Jung's grandson Dieter Baumann, also an analyst, followed in the footsteps of his grandfather to Taos to meet the elderly Indian who had had such an impact on Jung. It was very moving because, I mean, uh, 40 years before, uh, my grandfather had met him and uh, he could remember very well and uh, uh, showed me that they had talked there on the roof uh, with each other. And, I, f I found him a very, a very fine man, a very special man. He was very intelligent and uh, he had a very soft face, also very human, profoundly human. I think he had a very deep feeling. We do feel with the heart or think with the heart. See, Mountain Lake said, how cruel the whites look. Their lips are thin, their noses sharp their faces furrowed and distorted by folds. Their eyes have a staring expression. They're always seeking something. What are they seeking? The whites always want something. They're always uneasy and restless. We do not know what they want. We do not understand. We think that they are mad. For the first time in my life, so it seemed to me, someone had drawn for me a picture of the real white man. This Indian had struck our vulnerable spot, unveiled a truth to which we are blind. Indian religious rituals have two main forms, ritual dances to honor the gods and to assist in the successful progress of farming and harvesting, and chants by medicine men. The chant can last as long as nine days and is used for healing both physical and psychological illness. In Taos, Jung witnessed ceremonial dances like the eagle dance. To the Pueblo Indians, the eagle and the buffalo are both sacred animals. Religious traditions dictate that eagle feathers must be used in ceremony and ritual, so the tribe thanks and honors the bird by imitation. also saw Indian rituals. The main message from the Indians was, for me, the respect for the earth, the religious attitude towards the earth. They are really in touch with the spirit of the earth. Lily Salvador is a traditional Indian potter in New Mexico. That rock was left here for my mother, by her mother. She had used it to grind either corn or what I did was grind the pot with shards and our clay on there to make it real fine. The shards are from in the hills. When we take a hike, we find them and we bring them back because they're used back into our clay, used as a temper. So it's an old and a new pot put together. What Jung and Baumann both encountered was a culture where religion, history, ritual and mythology are fully integrated. The new clay is uh, found at a secret place. Only the potters know where to get it. And there's no road to it, so we just have to carry it on our backs. I don't think if anybody else, like, um, the Anglo or anybody else, if they learned how to form the pot, they won't have that feeling of 
the clay or just the touch of our ancestors there. The pots themselves are not merely decorative. They tell the history of the Akama tribe's search for their promised land, the high mesa of Akama, known as Sky City, and claimed as the oldest inhabited settlement in the United States. The story of the long journey to the Akama's tribal home is passed down the female line, and the potters are always women, who give the story expression in the traditional form. The design here represents how our people had traveled a long time ago. It was told to us that they had traveled in a circle, always looking for a place that was ready for them. In our language, Akama means a place that was ready, or the promised land. And the lines represent your rain. It rained on them. And right here is your sun. And it's coming out of the cloud here. The myth of the Akama people reflects the everyday reality of many of the Indian tribes. Wherever there is rain or water of any kind, there can be agriculture, food and survival. But the tribe is not only at the mercy of the elements, its traditions also bring the elements into harmony. Lily Salvador's pots require the clay earth and fire to set them hard, but they also need the life-giving water and air as well. That's what we always have in mind, is moisture. After I finish making a pot, I'm told to blow into them to give them a heart or their own spirits. And down at the bottom, when we draw our first line, we are told not to close it completely, and that brings in the spirit. The spirits of my ancestors are there. Jung's meeting with Indians was brief. But like his contact two years later with the African tribesmen, he encountered a society for whom mythology was the religious explanation of their life and origins, expressed in story and ritual. Jung was quite sure that man is not complete without a living mythology or religion. Unlike his European patients, tribal people had a sense of meaning to their lives. Ochwer Beano told him that through the ritual, every morning they made the sun come. If they didn't come, the sun wouldn't rise anymore and it would uh, be the end of the world. He realized that people have to live uh, their own myths. And uh, it was important to him that they were related to something important, were related to something uh, greater than themselves, and that is all that matters. He found uh, similar uh, instances with, uh, with them and with others, and uh, this made him believe in the all presence of the unconscious, the collective unconscious. In his travels and studies, Jung saw mythologies as the expression of the collective unconscious. When stories, images or symbols appeared in similar form but in different cultures, he called them archetypes. These represent a common human inheritance of patterns of thought and action or basic psychological instincts. It is quite certain that uh, man is born with a certain functioning, a certain way of functioning, a certain pattern of behavior. And uh, that is expressed in the form of archetypal images or archetypal forms. For instance, the way in which a man should behave is given by an archetype. Yeah. And therefore, you see, the primitives tell that stories, uh, a great deal of education goes through storytelling. He thought that scientific industrial man was suffered 
great psychic distress and frustration because the religious side of our nature was repressed. Jung was trying to speak to that, to bring it forward. According to the Jungian tradition, uh, our religions are produced something like works of folk art. Religion is the heart and center of culture, and it's through religion that we work out a common vocabulary of rituals and symbols, which together makes up a kind of house of meaning that we dwell in, our particular vision of the universe, of human life, of human personal relations, and so on. In Africa, Jung sat with the Algoni men as they told their myths and stories. For instance, they call in a palaver of the young men and uh, to older men perform before the eyes of the younger all the things they should not do. <laughs> yeah. And at the end they say, no, that's exactly the thing you shall not do. Another way is they tell them of all the things they should not do. They tell them, and you should, like the decalogue, thou shalt not. Yes, yes. And, uh, and that is always um, uh, supported by uh, mythological tales. For instance, our ancestors have done so and so. Uh, uh, and so you shall do. Yeah. Or such and such a hero has done so and so, uh, and uh, that is your uh, model. Yeah. In Greek, you know, there was a Theseus, there was a Heracles, uh, models of fine men, of gentlemen, you know. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, and they teach us how to behave. They are archetypes. I see. I archetypes see. of behavior. In his research and travel in Africa, America and Britain, Jung absorbed mythological material and above all images to relate to his patients' dreams and the images of their unconscious. And everywhere, he found evidence of the collective unconscious. Author Robert Johnson. He discovered it in the unconscious of his own patients and in his own extraordinary experiences of dreams and visions, and also in the mythology, which fascinated him. The fact that mythology from every part of the world carries so many elements in common fascinated him. Well, there are certain myths that are timeless and universal, such as the hero myth, the, uh, the uh, trickster cycle, uh, of, uh, which you find among the American Indians or among African natives or in Australia or anywhere. These are on a primitive tribal level, but they can be found in the dreams of modern people just as well. And they are found in the Far East as well as in the Christian West. to be born today and to live in no myth, in, without history. That's, that's, that is a, a disease that's absolutely abnormal because man is not born every day. He's once born in, in a specific historical setting with the specific historical qualities and therefore he's only complete when he has a relation to, to these things. But a myth is a story which to those who told it and who heard it um, was a believable story and, and a real event that actually took place. But it is in fact an exemplary story. It illustrates or exemplifies um, essential um, factors in human existence or it accounts for things like the creation of the world or of certain human situations but told in the form of a story. Mythology is not only tribal, foreign and primitive. The Arthurian legends survive in Britain, and when in England to see Godwin Baines, Jung and his wife made a point of visiting Glastonbury, one of the most evocative sites of Arthurian mythology. Count Nikolai Tolstoy. It is a British myth. It's the British, the matter of Britain, as they call it, but it was called the matter of Britain on a continent, and it um, has been accepted the world over. It's, you could almost call it the myth. And I suppose, because it fulfills so many archetypal patterns. And Arthur, of course, is, is the archetypal king. He later became um, a figure who was believed to be sleeping beneath a mountain in a cavern surrounded by his knights to be called again in the hour of need. Well, there again, the, the idea of retiring into the heart of the mountain and living on there, as I'm sure, 
this descent back into the unconscious. Many visitors today are drawn to a site which has only vague mythological connections. Underneath Glastonbury Tor, legend has it that the Holy Grail is buried, the object of the constant quest of King Arthur and his knights. I think it is fascinating that these places draw people, and they don't just draw them because they're beautiful. I mean, the tour is very striking, but it's the strikingness, I think, which is probably the key. It looks different, it feels different, and that's how it occurred to early peoples, and so they invested it with this numinous quality. Tintagel Castle in Cornwall is Arthur's supposed birthplace, where Merlin discovered the infant king to be washed up on the shore. In the case of Tintagel, there isn't really any um, very good evidence to link it to the story of Arthur. The fact is that people simply do invest these places with a numinous quality um, without knowing, and it's not necessary really, to know the true story of what lies behind it. In a sense, you can say the facts are dispensable. There must, one would suspect, be a need, and that is certainly the case with myth, that all societies, certainly up until quite recently, uh, lived by myths, and we have our own maybe distorted myths, and, and where we don't have them, probably our state reflects that. If you break up a tribe, they lose their religious ideas, the treasure of their old traditions, and they feel out of form completely. They lose their raison d'etre. All the meaning goes out of their life. It does not make sense anymore, because we infect them with our own insanity. Traditional tribal people understand the importance of retaining their religions and staying close to their myth. Jung recognized Mountain Lake's idea that the Pueblo Indians think with the heart as a source of psychological health. In eastern Arizona, the Navajo Indians have their reservation. Their religion is based on a system of healing ceremonies or chants intended to cure illness or to bring members of the tribe back into harmony with the tribal traditions. Sand paintings illustrate the stories and symbolism of tribal mythology, created by hand with naturally coloured sands. Many Jungian psychologists have followed Jung's footsteps to visit the Indians of New Mexico and Arizona. For Donald Sandner, the interest is in the Navajos. For 15 years, he has studied their ceremonies and drawn certain parallels with Jungian psychology. You could say that in the Navajo system, there is a myth behind every chant, and there were, behind each chant, there, there was a story. And if you had a certain illness, for instance, let's say you had what they would call joint pain, swelling, arthritis, or rheumatism, that you would find, you would look for, you would say, what hero or what heroine, some of them are women, uh, the heroines of the story, uh, what heroine had that disease? So you might say, ah, that I identify. You would be identifying already with her. So you would choose that chant. The chant is a recitation of part of one of the epic mythological stories about the gods and the early history of the tribe, and the sand paintings in the ceremony illustrate the story symbolically.
But then the patient comes in and he identifies by sitting on some part of the sand painting. He identifies with that power in the sand painting. And uh, it would be roughly paralleling the myth, although the myth is not told, it's never told. It's assumed that you know it already. And that power is put on the patient. And at that moment, the patient takes it in. He identifies with the medicine man, with the, with the, with the uh, power in the painting, and with the hero or heroine of the whole chant. And he himself inwardly goes through that, uh, that process of being healed by that identification. <laughs> In the Navajo, they, they say that if the patient doesn't believe and actively, he has to not only believe, but actively concentrate on what's going on. The patient wanted, wanted to get well, see. He wanted to get back on his feet, and, and that's what, that's what it is. So it's, up, it's really it's up to the patient, you know. He has to, the symbolism, the images have to enter his mind and there activate that unconscious part of his mind. And he has to do that. And, and in, the, in the Jungian analysis also, it's the patient. If, if there are no dreams, we can work with other things, but the patient must produce the symbolism in order for it to be worked on. Some symbols recur in almost every sand painting. Lightning flashes, rainbows, and the warrior gods and star gods are the most common. They are found in many different cultures, and Jung recognized these symbolic strands as archetypes. The rich Navajo symbolism is not confined to healing chants and rituals. It is also used for the decoration of the Navajo arts and crafts. Zoni Jones weaves rugs which are replicas of the sand paintings and healing ceremonies. I mean, if you want a kind of a place to look for corroboration of a lot of Jung's views, particularly the ones about archetypes and the collective unconscious, you could do no better than to look into like the Navajo symbol system where it's all there. It's all put together from the collective unconscious. It's a traditional design handed down to me from my mother. There will be a sun and a moon here. I know what the finished rug will look like without having any plan of it on paper. There will be four gods like this one here. This is the lightning. And this is the rainbow around the edge. One symbol that appears constantly across cultures, in religion, mythology and dreams, is the serpent or snake. In uh, Navajo painting, the snake appears in a uh, great many of the chants, almost, well, the great majority of them have a snake in it somewhere, and this is also true of people's dreams. In a lengthy analysis, there's almost always very important dreams that center around the snake. Once I, I have a patient, a young woman, about 20, 27 or 8, and at first, Words well when I had treated her. He said, You know, doctor, I come to you because I have a, a, a snake in my abdomen. Hmm. I said, What? <laughs> he said, uh, yes, a snake, uh, a black snake coiled up right in the, in, 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 in the bottom of my abdomen. And I must have made a rather uh, bewildered uh, face. At her, and she said, "You know, uh, I, I, I don't mean it literally, uh, <laughs> but uh, I should say it was a snake. It was a snake." <laughs> well, now uh, that is that is a collective symbol. That yeah. is not a, an, in, an individual fantasy. That yeah. is a collective fantasy. I come out part of, yeah, that I is see. that is well known in India. Yeah, well, she, she has nothing to do with India, but uh, we have it too. But it was generally human, but it's entirely unknown. So that I, even in the first moment, thought 
Uh, perhaps he's crazy. But she wasn't only highly intuitive. It is in India known, and it is a, the, the basis of a whole philosophical system of tantrism. Uh, this is Kundalini. Kundalini serpent. I see. You see? And, uh, and that is something known to some few specialists. Uh, generally, it's not known that we have a, a certain in, in the abdomen. Yeah, yeah. But that is a collective, you see? Yeah. That is a yeah. collective yeah. dream yeah. or a collective fantasy. Yeah. Well, the snake is one of the best uh, symbols of the unconscious itself because it seems so far away from human consciousness and feeling. <clears throat> it seems to have a, an autonomous life of its own, and therefore it, just, it inspires fear, but at the same time it inspires curiosity and a kind of uh, beauty that uh, relates it to the possibility of a sort of earth wis wisdom. So Jung thought it uh, represented the kind of lower nervous system, the spine and the, the, the lower parts of the brain stem. So that that was the snake, that, that deep, unconscious, cold, sort of inhuman power that governs us, even when we don't know it. The serpent is wise only because it doesn't close its eyes. You know, they have no eyelids so that they can't close their eyes. They seem to be uh, eternally awake and aware. And by projection, man might think that he could also acquire that kind of awareness. The symbol itself, such as these things we've been talking about, these snakes, these animals, these uh, things you uh, dream about, have a power of their own that can be healing. Besides his travels and scholarly research, Jung's true work was the healing of his patients in his house on the lake at Kusnacht. Jung left no case notes of the patients he saw for analysis, but at the Jung Institute in Kusnacht, there is a large collection of the paintings which he encouraged his patients to produce, extending and illustrating the dream images of their unconscious. Michael Edwards is the curator of the archive. The clue to the healing or the, the way into the work was really through the imagination. And so he would encourage his patients to amplify and make more of um, their material because the unconscious seems to work in images. It's if that's the language of the unconscious and therefore for the person consciously to work with their images in a spontaneous way would put them in touch with themselves. Whether in single images produced by patients or whole series of paintings, parallels with sand paintings and other mythological or religious images can be seen. The symbols individually have force and the patient creates a mythological narrative in pictures. I think I have certainly learnt from Jung that the role of the image, even if it's an image as imagined, that it has an authority, that the image is not something simply in order to make a clever psychological diagnosis and then throw it away, but the image has power and value of its own. Jung believed, as I understand it, that the story was purposive, that it knew where it was going in its own way. It didn't follow a rational logic, but in the same way that a, a good novel uh, keeps us interested by taking twists and turns and yet uh, having a sense of being convincing about it. So these inner stories, these private stories, also, I think, um, had that same feeling of inevitability, which I think is archetypal. At his tower on the lake at Bowlingham, Jung produced images and mythological symbols as his patients did. He painted, sculpted and carved the most important characters and images from his inner life. His travels had confirmed his views that in more primitive societies, myths and archetypes still had a force. In Europe, mythology was no longer a living influence. Dr. Gerhard Adler. Most of all, in his journey, both to to Pueblos and to Rigonis, he learned to look at the uh, Europeans, America, Europeans, as, as a white man, we may say, 
as uh, from outside. And he saw that uh, this was quite, quite wrong to believe that the white man had the, all the truth. Today, the idea that man does not have all the truths or all the answers seems commonplace. Jung looked to man's lost psychic origins to restore some balance. However, some Jungian analysts now argue that we are still ruled by myth, but by a new myth, and we are unaware of the fact. Analyst James Hillman. Yes, the modern man had lost his myth, had lost his sense of myth. But you see, we've moved that, we've moved that. Now we realize that technology is our myth. The myth is always the thing you're in and don't know it's a myth. Mythology is always present. It's like asking, is matter present in, the, in today's world? Yes, of course. See, science is, uh, is man's current, current authority. It's, uh, it's the one thing that is, uh, is believable now. It's, uh, it's our reality, and uh, we can't escape that. A much more difficult thing to say, and antagonistic to many ears, is that science is our present myth. Science is our as if. Has science replaced religion in that sense? Yes. For most people, science is their religion. The same thing applies to science fiction. It's a modern mythology. And I think it's safe to say that science fiction, in, in all its various uh, forms and variations, does have one basic recurring theme. It's the theme of extraterrestrial intelligence in one form or another. There are, it has a multitude of forms it can take, but that's the basic idea. And uh, that's highly significant uh, psychologically because it, it demonstrates that the The second center of the psyche, the self, is all ready to be discovered. For San Francisco analyst John Beebe, the massive appeal of science fiction films like the Star Wars trilogy comes from combining the archetypal fantasy of extraterrestrial life with characters which represent our own contemporary culture. I'm not gonna let something tear it apart. To me, the movie comes alive because it has so many of the elements of our culture all scattered around through it. All right, let's get out of here! Yeah. The Empire is still out there. I don't think it's right! No time to discuss this a committee! I am not a committee! The uh, princess is a little bit like uh, a rather pert, but very nevertheless uh, uh, American uh, women's lib kind of, kind of princess. And uh, then, of course, we have the uh, R2, D2, and uh, the butler uh, as a kind of Laurel and Hardy. And, of course, uh, we have uh, uh, the cowardly lion. And um, a young, uh, kind of uh, sparky, spanking, clean young, uh, young hero uh, questing. Kind of, and you have the wise old man. And you have all these uh, loose archetypes of the culture. To see myth as something that's happening all the time, that myths are being made all the time. So that it's sort of interesting when a movie becomes not a kind of uh, updated depiction of an old myth, but creates its own new myth. As we send our spacecraft beyond the solar system, carrying coded communications from the human planet. Perhaps science fiction expresses the idea that humankind cannot, after all, rely on the intellectual, conscious life alone. Special. Analyst James Hillman sums up Jung's travels as a way of learning through first-hand experience what the European psyche had allowed to become hidden. Remember, always Jung has a theory in his actions. And the theory was that the cultural overlay disguises archetypes more than it reveals them. That was part of what Jung 
was doing with his travels. And there's no, no doubt that it's, uh, you see things you don't see in our ordinary culture. Old Mountain Lake said to me, we are the people who live on the roof of the world. We are the sons of the sun who is our father. We help him daily to rise and to cross over the sky. We do this not only for ourselves, but for the Americans also. He correctly assumes that their day, their light, their consciousness and their meaning will die when destroyed by the narrow-mindedness of American rationalism. And the same will happen to the whole world when subjected to such treatment. We've lost certain ancient myths or connection to the world as mythical, but we're still living myths. We can't, we can't ever step outside of a myth. We're in one now, we're in one in television as a myth. We're in one, and it carries us as we, whatever we're doing. And to de declare myth only something that people tell each other around the campfire, or dance naked to, or paint themselves purple, is not what, that's not the whole story of myth. Myth is what captures your imagination and moves your language and your body in, into doing th things in certain ways. So we're always in myth. <laughs> Africa, New Mexico, England and Switzerland, Jung's discovery of the collective unconscious unites humanity at an instinctual, mythical, imaginative level. What he intuitively knew and confirmed among African tribes and on a Pueblo rooftop, conscious life is constantly forgetting. My dear friend Mountain Lake, are your young men still worshipping the Father Son? I am busy exploring the truth in which Indians believe. It always impressed me as a great truth, but one hears so little about it. All you tell me about religion is good news to me. There are no interesting religious things over here, only remnants of old things. I was glad to hear that you are in better health than when I saw you. I'm sure your tribe needs you very much and I wish that you will live still many years, as ever your friend, C.G. Jung. Once was a man who lived among mountains. All his life he dreamed and investigated his own dreams and other people's. He was a psychiatrist who talked about the soul, a scientist and a scholar, a man committed to finding meaning in our everyday lives. His dreams have changed our ideas. His name was Carl Gustav Jung. He wrote the first introduction to Zen Buddhism. He began with Greek mythology, or didn't begin, but at least brought it in. He, uh, you know, the gods and the goddesses, the myths. He was concerned with the American Indians. He visited them. He was interested in synchronicity. He was interested in astrology. Um, and he wrote on all these subjects and had lots of good things to say about them. What's the value of your dreams? in the everyday world? What's the value of your fantasies in the everyday world? These are enormously important, the sense of having, of being a mess of complexes. Jung gave us all that. It's a cliche to talk about now the meaning of life or something being meaningful or not meaningful. I think Jung in a way is responsible uh, for this kind of, of cliche. Carl Gustav Jung's work 
brought dreams and the unconscious into the modern world and introduced a respect for the psyche in human affairs. In 1957, aged 82, Jung gave his first film interview. His thoughts touch upon universal questions, from love, marriage and relationships to international hostilities. Characteristically, Jung expressed his political thoughts in terms of the psyche. Nowadays, particularly, the, the world hangs on a thin thread. Yeah. And that is the psyche of man. We are the great danger. The psyche is the great danger. What if something goes wrong with the psyche? Yeah. You see? Since his death in 1961, Jung's ideas have become increasingly influential. His work in the world has been extended into the psychological study of war and war trauma. Architecture. Alcoholism and drug addiction. The stock market. Aging, senility and death. Even movies and movie stars. In many countries, especially the United States, Jungian psychology is tackling new themes. For San Francisco analyst John Beebe, it's the movies. Whenever uh, you see a film uh, uh, in a dream, someone is watching a film or going to the movies, that's a not uncommon uh, dream image. Um, I think it means that um, uh, we're looking at a situation that has been thoroughly studied. It's been uh, cut and edited, so to speak, and honed in on and presented for us, and it's a completely understood situation now. And if we just watch it through, we will have a complete sense of what it is. In the book that was compiled from a series of his seminars on dreams, Jung himself spoke of the psychological vitality of film. The movies are far more efficient than the theatre. They are less restricted. They are able to produce amazing symbols to show the collective unconscious, since their methods of presentation are so unlimited. Because in our own individual life, we only get a chance to see perhaps one little piece of a whole archetypal pattern. But in a movie, we can have the whole pattern laid out for us in a couple of hours. And in a great enough film, there's really a sense of having been translocated from one's own personal experience and the little pit that one has experienced to something truly universal. And I think that's what the, the archetype can do. It's sort of a, a ticket of admission um, to a broader perspective. The patients who came to consult Jung at his house in Kusnacht varied widely, from American heiresses and the German writer Hermann Hesse to the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. Dr. Jeffrey Satinover. Basically, the motive for starting Alcoholics Anonymous came out of a patient of Jung's experience. And Jung's communicating to that patient the idea that essentially he was not going to ever successfully get over his alcoholism if he did not find God. The official history of Alcoholics Anonymous traces the group's origins to Jung's diagnosis of the incurable alcoholic known only as Roland H. His craving for alcohol was the equivalent on a low level of the spiritual thirst of our being for wholeness, expressed in medieval language, the union with God. What people seek in addictive experience is something which in and of itself is normal. That, that is to say, the craving is normal. The craving for certain kinds of elation, for a certain sense of specialness, for heroism, for cessation of pain, and underlying all of those really, ultimately and, and most powerful, is the uh, seeking of a sense of meaningfulness. Dr. Jeffrey Satinova has established a clinic specializing in senility and Alzheimer's disease and addiction to drugs and alcohol. You've seen some of the early signs of it already. The therapy goes beyond the alcoholic or senile patient to include other family members. What we hope an individual will gain from the psychotherapeutic dimension of substance abuse treatment is a way of finding meaning in their lives again. Because as Jung correctly recognized, ultimately the, the key motivating factor in the beginning of an addiction is the seeking of 
spirit. When Roland H. first arrived in his consulting room, Jung told him that unless he could find a way to a religious or spiritual experience, his addiction was incurable. You see, alcohol in Latin is spiritus, and you use the same word for the highest religious experience as well as for the most depraving poison. The helpful formula, therefore, is spiritus contra spiritum. Dionysus uh, was not the god of drunkenness. He was the god of ecstatic vision. He was a god of wine, but that was the wine of religion, not the wine of drunkenness. For Robert Johnson, the Greek god Dionysus offers an insight into the modern epidemic of alcoholism. Johnson draws on mythology for fables of psychological reality. His latest book considers the gods of antiquity and our universal need for emotional highs or ecstasy. It is basic, and if we don't get our ecstasy, which is an archetypal quality, in a legitimate way, we will get it in an illegitimate way, which accounts for much of the chaos of this culture now. We have to have an ecstatic dimension of our life. In all ancient cultures, the heights of the mountains and the heavens have been identified as the place of the gods. Moses received the Ten Commandments from his god on the mountaintop. The Greek gods dwelt on Mount Olympus. The Pueblo Indians lived close to their father, son, on the 6,000-foot high plateau of New Mexico. The metaphor of height applied to a mental state is, is universal. And when an individual seeks the experience of getting high, the implication is that they chronically, or as a matter of course, do not feel high. But the modern age has conquered all the heights and even invaded the heavens. Jung was dismayed. The gods have become diseases. Zeus no longer rules Olympus, but rather the solar plexus, and produces curious specimens for the doctor's consulting room, or disorders the brains of politicians and journalists, who unwittingly let loose psychic epidemics on the world. That's a quote from Dr. Jung. He said, when we dismantled Olympus, we turned the gods into symptoms. If there's not, this is only a restatement of a moment ago, if we don't get a particular archetypal quality legitimately, it will, so to speak, pop up somewhere in its symptomatic, that is, its compulsive form. The Swiss analyst Adolf Guggenbull Craig, perhaps surprisingly, sees the business world as another example of the archetypal quest for the gods or the soul. When you deal with money, you really know if you have a right or wrong. You know, you lose or you win. There's no argument, you lost or you win. And it might give you then an elated feeling, nearly a religious feeling that you were on the right side, that you were so much in touch with the gods that you actually won. The speculators, the people who really only deal with money, they don't really deal with money as a thing to buy something with, but they deal with money because they want to get more gold or they want to get more soul in the end. I think the speculators speculate that they think they can get the life essence by having more and more money. The business world remains a masculine world. It was Jung's view that masculine patriarchal values have produced a culture which neglects the soul and the balancing influence of the feminine psyche. Analyst Andrew Samuels. Jung intuited an imbalance in Western culture in favor of one whole style of psychological and behavioral functioning, in favor of analysis, in favor of logic, in favor of external achievement, in favor of social hierarchicalism and so forth. He asked, what happened to the other side? He entered into reflection both conscious and unconscious at a time when culturally the role of women 
was changing and shifting. People began to protest and wanted the vote and so on. So he contributed to something which has become a movement of our times. I think the feminine stands against organization, for example, against organized religion. It stands against hierarchy, for example, class systems. It stands against an over-dependence on logic and rationality, so that the hard sciences are challenged. It stands against an excessive dependency on technology, and so it espouses natural issues, an interest in ecology, in the environment. We women embody life. You men act upon life. That resonates psychologically, which means that we are constantly working with it in terms of our aims, our ideals, our understandings and perceptions of what it's like to be ourselves now and in life. Jung observed that for every woman, there was a masculine aspect within her psyche, the archetype of the animus, and for every man, a feminine counterpart, the anima. The anima is, is an archetype, uh, an archetypal form expressing the fact that a man has a minority of feminine or female uh, genes. Yeah. And that is something that doesn't appear, disappear in him, that is constantly present, and it works as a female in a man. The same is the case with the animus, that is a masculine image in a woman's mind, uh, which is not ex sometimes quite conscious, sometimes it is not conscious, but it is called into life the moment that woman meets a man who says the right things. And then because he said it is all true, and he is, he is the fellow, no matter what he is. Yeah. And the whole point is that the female ego has to be in charge of the animus. Now, that's not a, a generally accepted idea, because the old hangover of you lean on men, and men will somehow make your life interesting or something. and you just lose all your own ideas or innovations or creativity. And I think a lot of women are scared out of being who they are and doing whatever is important to them still. The animus to me is one of the most significant concepts that has arisen in Jungian psychology. Um, it speaks of the function that connects a woman with her deepest self and personhood, her creativity, the unformed that's forming as she ages, her work, her word, her ideas, herself, her person. In the Alfred Hitchcock film, Notorious, John Beebe finds a drama of the animus in the conflict between a woman and men. Just a minute, Miss Huberman. Hold on, Miss Huberman. Would you please? We'd like a statement from you, Miss Huberman, about your father. For instance, do you think your father got what he deserved? Could we say that you're pleased your father's going to pay the penalty for being a German worker? Now, notice the way the woman is badgered by a series of men. All the people holding uh, cameras are men, and all the people who speak to her are men. And so you immediately get the image of a woman in a vulnerable position, badgered by uh, a group a or a series of men. Now, there's the perfect image of what Jung means by the animus, the way the animus attacks the woman and the way it's often symbolized by a multiple figure or a crowd and the way it moves in on the woman and judges her. The cameras are all on the lower left hand of the screen. 
And then gradually we realize that in the lower left hand, there is now one man whose viewpoint we have. And he's a dark kind of unknown figure. She's half attracted to him, half uh, suspicious of him, wonders, is he a policeman? This is the uh, experience of so many women of constantly being under an attack. Do I look okay? Is my reputation okay? The camera turns and finally he becomes a personality in his own right. Indeed, he's Cary Grant. There's one more drink left to peace. Shame about the ice. So that the very Stop. critic, the very thing that's Stop. most attacking the woman, is also somehow the Why thing that's like most that? erotically exciting and the most interesting and the most energetic. And there, right. in a little nutshell, you get if you, the problem of the animus. Now, you see, the archetype is a force. It has an autonomy. It can suddenly seize you. It is like a seizure. So, for instance, falling in love at first sight, yeah. that is such a case. You see, you have a certain image in yourself without knowing it of the woman, of the woman. Yeah. Now you see that girl, or at least a good imitation of your type. Yeah. And instantly you get a seizure and you're, you're gone. Yeah. And afterwards you may discover that it was a hell of a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> the concepts of animus and anima emerged as Jung observed the lives and psychological realities of his patients, and they help in understanding both the pain and the delights of human relationship. Robert Johnson. Man insists upon making some outer figure, generally a flesh and blood woman, bear his anima for him. That is, he mediates uh, the outer world by way of his anima instead of using her inside where she belongs. This produces more suffering and more upset and more pain than any other single thing that I know about. Oh, you see, a man is quite capable Oh, he's intelligent enough to see that that woman of his choice, as one says, not no choice, he has been captured. You know, he sees that he, she's no good at all, that she's a hell of a business. And, and he, he tells me so, and he says, for God's sake, doctor, help me to get rid of that woman. He can't. He's, he, he's like laying her fingers. And that is the archetype. That is so called archetype of the anima. This contribution of Jung's animus and anima theory is not only of immense use in understanding relationship difficulties and the joys and richnesses of relationships, but it's actually something, as with all the best ideas, that people, ordinary people, are doing anyway. That's a real acid test of all psychological theory. If it really turns out to be a description of what's happening, it's good theory. James Hillman was director of studies at the Jung Institute in Zurich. After 25 years in Switzerland, he returned to America, to Dallas, Texas. The soundtrack to your weekend lifestyle. 106.1, The Oasis. Hillman analyzes patients' dreams but also sees the image of psyche in the architecture of cities and the shape and atmosphere of a landscape. The modern city is not for people, it's for business. And you drive in from the suburbs, you drive your car underground, put it in the garage, you don't come into the street at all, and then go up the elevator, and that's it. Walk up and down the halls, you could be in any kind of office building, and it's nothing to do with people. The thing about Dallas would be, see, the, the thing about the psyche in the world is that it's in the world and it's the places themselves have a psyche. And that psyche speaks through how it displays itself. What do we see in this building? What is this building displaying itself as? So that it has to have no openings on the ground floor for people, but just 
repelling walls. What is it for a building to be absolutely skinny and bare boned and stretching way up and empty on the interior with an atrium? I mean, that's an anorexic building. What are mirrored sunglasses telling us? You certainly can't look into the soul of the person into his eyes or her eyes. It's again that paranoid perspective of I can see you, but you can't see me. You, you feel different things in different buildings, but it isn't only that, it isn't, it's also the way the room is lit with a light coming straight down on you that casts no shadow, windows that can't be opened, you're in a little prison room. So of course you're going to have illnesses inside offices and psychological breakdown, which you can't just clarify by going to an analyst once a week. There's a darkness in the soil here. New England has the dead Indians and the dead witches and the dead Puritans and the, you know, we're, we're walking over the dead here, really. And they, they give the soil more, of, or the psyche of the soil, much more um, sadness. This sense of the soil having blood in it gives depth to, uh, gives soul to the place. Now, if the mood is in the landscape, not just in your eye, but the mood is in the landscape, then uh, it's got a soul. And what the history of the landscape will be there, too. Jung observed the unchanging human need for archetypal experiences. Today, the gods have vanished, and we seek ecstasy and meaning in wealth and power, drugs and alcohol, or the lives of the famous. We project our fantasies onto public figures, political leaders, royalty, sporting heroes, musicians, and movie stars. The collective unconscious is too big to live out personally. It's like asking someone to cope with the 100,000 volt power in a high tension line through the 110 volt wiring of, of the house to live out the collective unconscious himself. Much of it has to be lived by projection. I think there's no question um, that the person involved can get quite confused with the archetypal image that's being portrayed, and that can confuse people on both sides of the screen, so to, so to speak. Well, the famous example is Marilyn Monroe, and uh, in uh, a dream, uh, which she apparently uh, reported to someone and was written down, she was standing uh, naked in a church and all kinds of people were coming in and uh, worshiping her there. And uh, of course, simply said, this is the love goddess, but in its religious aspect. It seems to me that um, her education and her consciousness and the amount of uh, uh, security she had in her early background didn't give her uh, a strong enough ego or a strong enough uh, personality to um, stand up to an archetypal image like that and, and criticize it and say, well, it's as if in some way uh, my image is terribly important to people and has religious significance, and no wonder there's so little goddess in our culture, no wonder they would use me in this way. And I think there the person gets swallowed uh, by the image. These men are veterans of the Vietnam War. To Jungian psychologists, as to Jung himself, war and war experiences are just as psychological as falling in love. Harry Wilmer. It isn't just there is good, there is evil. 
but there is both, and there's both in us. And that connects with the shadow, with the dark side. That's something I never understood prior to the, the kind of Jungian work that, that I did. Jung observed that in personal relationships and the dealings between communities, the dark side, or the shadow, exists alongside bright and positive qualities. And he saw that the shadow, when not accepted and understood, will be projected within marriage, within the workplace, within warfare, and within dreams. The young Americans who were drafted in their tens of thousands to fight the Vietnam War failed to achieve victory. The psychological wounds they suffered are not yet healed. Harry Wilmer. The war experience obviously was no different than any other war experience. We didn't call it a war. We called it a conflict, it was a police action. We were dealing with a enemy that was a foreign body, so to speak, if you want to put it that way. We wanted to exterminate. The consequences were that it permitted us to deny the existence of these men who were as heroic as any men in any war and to project our shadow. We call them losers and dope fiends and uh, baby killers and all the things that we despise. Harry Wilmer works with Vietnam veterans in Texas. Even 20 years after the war, Many veterans still carry the burden of military failure and the blame for the horrors of war. They carried the image of losing. They carried the image of destructivity, of violence, of darkness, and even evil, which is in all of us. When these men came home, nobody wanted to acknowledge them. Nobody wanted to hear what they had to say. Many of Dr. Wilmer's veteran patients suffered from recurring nightmares of their own war experiences or of terrible violence and carnage which happened to others. The dreams to me represent the only uncontaminated history we have of the war. It's as if it is there now. And, you know, Jung talks about the reality of the psyche. It was as if I had the privilege of, if you want to call it the privilege, the painful privilege of being in the Vietnam War. This is the story of one of those dreams. This was Bill, who had lost his leg in a mine explosion, a landmine. And he had had this dream several times a week for many years. Nobody listened to them. The dream was we were on a search and destroy mission, and we were going through a friendly village. A baby was crying in a hooch. That's a little native house. And no one else was there. And uh, my buddy went into the hooch, and he saw the crying baby. And the captain at the, at the outside shouted, don't pick it up, don't pick it up. But he didn't hear the words, and he reached for the baby, and he picked the baby up, and the baby exploded. It was booby-trapped. There was nothing left of the baby and just parts of my friend. And uh, it was grenades. And he could never get over that cry or that sound or that somehow or another he hadn't done something. And that's a kind of typical combat nightmare. They stay the same, repeat over and over and over. American GIs were killed by booby-trapped babies in Vietnam, but Bill had not seen such horrors. His recurring nightmare reflected his own maiming in other circumstances. For the first time, Dr. Wilmer accepted Bill's dream as a real experience. The possibility of transformation and of healing begins when a new, unrealistic element arises in the dream. Something comes into the dream that didn't really happen. After all, if you dream 12 years of this and wake up in a cold sweat and a horror, thinking you're still there, when something happens in the dream that didn't really happen, it begins to take you out of that primal experience. 
And then the next stage is what I call the healing nightmare. When it is transformed, or when it next becomes a stage of an ordinary hallucinatory nightmare. Didn't happen, couldn't have happened far out. The kind of dreams that we all have from time to time. The healing nightmare allows the psyche to adapt from the horrors of combat to the normal processes of the unconscious. For Vietnam veterans, there were none of the parades or rituals which traditionally greet homecoming warriors on their return to ordinary life. There were no rites to sortie. There were no rituals. There was no way people were dumped 50, 60 hours from Vietnam into Des Moines, Iowa, or wherever. And there was nobody there. Al John is a Vietnam veteran who was shot down in combat. After he returned home to the Navajo reservation in Arizona, his overwhelming war memories returned repeatedly. I started having a backlash of what happened you know, when I got shot down and they had told me, to, let's go see that medicine man. They told me that uh, I had some stuff that I was still carrying from Vietnam. My memory is still back there. My memory is still in uh, the outside world, of uh, the Navajo reservation. Navajo medicine men perform chants to cure physical or psychological illness and to mark major events in the lives of members of the tribe. One chant is sung to mark the return of the warrior and is still used today. I had a sing on me, uh, one different, one kind, a song called uh, the Navajo Way, Seven Days. That kind of got you straightened out. And then I got, after that, summertime, I had another one on the squad dance. And so that really got me, my mind back together. I think. Well, we didn't have that, and we need that. And the Indians and all introverted cultures have ways of dealing with this, and, and we must learn from that. But then, with the memorial in Washington, this 400-foot black marble names of every veteran, that had a profound effect. That was the beginning of American grieving and of America's acknowledgement. You look at that, you know, and you see your own face in the dark granite behind the names. Navajo rituals are sung, and these veterans sing, to rehabilitate themselves in their culture. They were forced to carry the shadow of the American military involvement in Vietnam for failing to win and for the atrocities committed in war. And the shadow can only be lifted when it is understood. And I think that the rituals that go on now in hospitals or in groups uh, with therapists of all sorts, self-help groups, these are the way and it must touch other people too, not just the veterans, their families, their children, the world. The men became the war, and that is the very destructive thing, because we are those men. Just as Jung worked with the dreams that arose from the unconscious of his patients, so sand play provides the space and freedom for the unconscious to express itself in concrete pictures. Dora Kalf is a Jungian, but not a conventional analyst. I think, you know, you can only play when you're really free. You know, you have to be free within. What Jung said, you know, that this uh, psyche has a healing tendency is really shown 
in the sand pictures because this healing tendency in a way is able to take over when we are providing this free and protected space. Jung believed in certain psychological necessities, a sense of meaning or religion, honesty with oneself and with others, and respect for the dreams and fantasies produced by the unconscious. He also believed in play. Every creative individual whatsoever owes all that is greatest in his life to fantasy. The dynamic principle of fantasy is play, a characteristic also of the child, and as such, it appears inconsistent with the principle of serious work. It is short-sighted to treat fantasy on account of its risky or unaccountable nature as a thing of little worth. They can tell me stories, they can ta talk about their life, but we do not interpret. Because what I have observed, that when we start to do this way of sand play, that we can observe a kind of a process, you know, that leads into the inner realms of the personality. And maybe each time they touch even a deeper level, the patient shows you what comes from within. And the therapist sees from outside and understands what he wants to tell you through the symbolic language, you see. We would say that the people who play here, they also come into the collective unconscious, you know. And the collective unconscious means that this is meaningful for all people, that there are those symbols that are meaningful, not only, let's say, for Switzerland, but maybe just as well for England or in a different uh, continent. For instance, when they take Oriental or Far Eastern symbols, I think that they are near the bottom of their unconscious. Our culture has moved away from the instinctual life. And this is why we have various animals at display. We have, for instance, wild animals. And this could indicate for a person that they have not been in contact with their instincts. In the sound trays of one patient, Dora Kalf observes the transforming powers of the psyche, which can also be seen in dream analysis. This young man didn't know what to do with his life, but after a series of sand trays, something changed dramatically and he made a positive decision. He came and he said, I have decided to, stud me to study medicine. And I was quite surprised because we never talked about, you know, what he should study or what he should do. And then he made this picture. This is a city with the traffic and the police directing the traffic. And uh, we have all these houses, they have no windows. And therefore, I felt it was a very anonymous situation. Also, I don't think that these people pay any attention to who they encounter. And then there is the concrete of the place. And through this concrete breaks this beautiful flower. Now, what does that mean, you see? that although he lives in such a surrounding and he may have had no contact through his inner life, he felt all of a sudden, you see, that something was more important than all the surroundings that he was living in. We would never see that a white rose would be able to break through concrete. But these energies are so strong once they are awakened that they can do nearly impossible things. The followers of Jung who are old enough to have known him well are now in their last years themselves. 
Jung's work began with his own inner life. And for these analysts, the arrival of old age and the approach of death is an opportunity to observe what the unconscious has to say. When one is preparing for death, uh, uh, which is what I've been busy doing for the last 10 years, sounds lugubrious, but at my age it isn't. I've had an incredibly rich life, and, and uh, as I said, I call God Albert, and if they threw the switch on me tomorrow night time, uh, I would scrawl, Dear Albert, thank you, Joe. You know, I, this is my feeling about it. Dr. Dr. Adolf Guggenbull Craig, a Zurich analyst, has recently published a book called Old Fools. When I was young, I obviously hoped that one day I will understand what's going on. And uh, I was in some way admiring the people who were older because I thought they knew what they were talking about. And then all of a sudden one morning I woke up and I was old myself and wasn't a bit wiser and saw that I don't understand much or even understand some things less. And that's a bit depressing. Today, uh, old age is not appreciated very much. There are too many old people, so sometimes I'm ashamed to be still here with my 85 years. And the value which people give to old age is how young they feel, how useful. Well, that's a kind of tremendous pressure on these poor old people. They have not only to look younger, they even have to be more experienced and more clever and so on. Uh, I think it's an insult if you say to an old person, you look very young. So what sort of 85-year-old lady do you wish to feel? Feel? I feel that I wish to feel as I feel. I'm quite satisfied. I don't want to, to be different. No. I saw that one advantage, one uh, possibility in old age, which has been depicted in images too, is that when you're old, you don't have to care so much anymore. When you're old, you can say, what the hell, what does it matter if people think I'm an idiot or if I'm an old fool? And so the, ar the archetype of the old fool is really a fuller archetype than the old wise man, who is a one-sided uh, propaganda gimmick of older people to dominate the younger ones. Jungian analysts share a conviction that life has meaning, though it may be found only in retrospect, and though the meaning may be purely personal and of no wider significance. Aniela Jaffe. What is meaning? We create meaning, and that's so important. Afterwards, if I look back my, my long, long life, and there were things which were very difficult for me, if you try to understand your dreams and your fantasies, then perhaps you can, uh, you can find a meaning. Looking back, what Jung thought, reflection, reflection, looking back. <laughs> I was married, and it, it was, uh, uh, we were very, very young, 20 and 21, and, but it didn't last very long, so we divorced, and I thought, what, what can that mean? It is, uh, was ridiculous. Two students married and then going, going away. The meaning for me was this, this marriage saved my life because I got the Swiss passport. He was Swiss and I could go to Switzerland. I came to you. These are the details, you see which life creates, which one doesn't understand. But decades later, one understands. You see, I'm very old. And for a very, very long time, I didn't feel old. And I thought that I could and should, not so much should, but that one just did went on doing the same things when one was 85 or 86 or 89 uh, than, if one, than the things one did when one was 60 or 70. And I did not heed Jung at the time because I was very surprised sometimes when Jung, when he was about oh, end of 60, 70s, in the 70s, didn't do this or didn't do that because he said he was too old and I couldn't understand it. Jung used to say, 
If you can't take a hint from life, then life will hit you. And that, I think, is true. There were hints which I could have taken, and I didn't. And so I had to break my leg <laughs> before I uh, was ready or willing or able to understand what it really was about. Particularly, I felt uh, uh, some kind of relief, almost, that I could be old, that I was permitted to be old. It was the most extraordinary experience. And through that experience, I realized how wise Jung was. As Jung himself grew older, he spent more time at his tower in Bolingen, where he withdrew to think, write and remember, to carve, to dream, and perhaps above all, simply to play. In his childhood, Jung's games and fantasies gave him his first glimpses of the unconscious. For this remarkable man, half Swiss peasant and half world famous intellectual, play contained images and meaning as real as the concrete world around him. His grandson, Dieter Baumann. He played all the time. Uh, in, in Bollingen, he did his so called uh, waterworks, uh, uh, namely, he dug into uh, the, you see the slope by the lake there is saturated with water and so uh, the, the water kind of oozes out of it. And so he had a system of rivulets uh, which he connected into a mainstream uh, and then that went to the lake and already as a boy I, uh, I think when I was eight years old I, I helped him uh, there. I remember my son visiting Bollingen once when he was a little boy because he was a friend of the grandchildren of Jung. And then he came home and he said, oh, mommy, there was an old gentleman. And you know, he made all those little rivers in the, in the earth. We were playing ne next to the lake. And he wondered why he did this. <laughs> We know that every good idea and all creative work are the offspring of the imagination and have their source in what one is pleased to call infantile fantasy. Without this playing with fantasy, no creative work has ever yet come to birth. The debt we owe to the play of imagination is incalculable. It must not be forgotten that it is just in the imagination that a man's highest value may lie. Jung's life, 85 years long, was devoted to the reality of the psyche and the play of his imagination. No one can doubt the impact he has had on our age. For most of his life, he worked against the popular current of worldly perspectives, bringing unfamiliar ideas and unsettling observations to light. If today the unconscious is more than a mere abstraction, and if the psyche has become a reality, we owe that largely to the scientist and doctor who listened to the wisdom of the dream. Carl Gustav Jung. <laughs>